Good evening, uh, everyone. Thank uh, to Professor Crane. Thank to Matt. My name is uh, Angelo Mario Del Grosso, and uh, I am a computer engineer working on digital humanities research projects at the Institute for Computational Linguistics in Pisa. The title of my work is Thinking Like the Modern Operating Systems, the Omega Architecture and the Clavius Sandware Project. I'm not the only guy who has been worked on this contribution, but also Emiliano Giovannetti and Simone Marchi from the same institute have been involved in this initiative. In order to be clearer and faster, I hope, I prefer to help myself by reading some notes. As for this, and I apologize for my strong Italian accent. Throughout this talk, I will discuss briefly the Clavius on the web project, and I will show you some screenshots of the prototype tools that have been developed within the project. Are online and they are running, but I prefer to show you the screenshots in order to avoid internet troubles and to go forward more quickly. Furthermore, I will argue about the design choices and the architectural framework that have been shaped to realize a digital environment for studying and analyzing texts within a scholarly perspective. Specifically, I will introduce concepts we adopt like the domain-driven design, the abstract data types, the microkernel architecture, and the ongoing Omega project. Instead of starting with the theory and then moving towards concrete examples, I would like in this talk to start from the end and show you first the results by introducing the Clavius Sondweb project. This initiative aims to preserve and to promote the, Cla the Christophorus Clavius correspondence between some important scientists of his time, such as Galileo Galileo and Tycho Brahe. Clavius was a German Jesuit, mathematician and astronomer, famous for his work on Gregorian calendar and for editing work on the Euclid's element and the commentarius about Sacrobosco's De Sfera Mundi. The historical archives of the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome own these documents written in Latin and Italian. Clavius on the web has started in 2012 and various research partners collaborate to its development, namely my institute, the Gregorian University, and the Institute for Informatics and Telematics. This initiative was a great opportunity to put in place our research objective regarding the implementation of a general environment for, textual, for scholarly textual studies. During the activity of the Clavius on the Web project, a number of prototype tools have been developed. The first prototype represents the access point to the digital archive. It lists the images of the letters and it allows to run various analysis tools for processing the textual content of the digitized resources. The second tool concerns the first version of the encoder and annotator tool. This view shows some important ideas of the underlying data model as well as how we have handled the data entry workflow. Actually, the data model relies on three basic elements, namely the content of the document, the selection of textual fragments, and finally, a semantic annotation. The textual references have been managed by means of CTS URIs. The third prototype is an improvement of the encoder and annotator. In particular, this tool provides the manuscript facsimile and the more complex markup language impl implemented by means of a domain-specific language. This domain-specific markup considers some insights and conventions that philologists know from their domain. For example, the square brackets with ellipses indicate a gap. The fourth tool is in charge of querying the textual resources with the full text as well as a lexical-based system. In particular, the indexing engine is able to retrieve textual passages through a query indicating, uh, indicating a lexical sense. The fifth prototype is an improvement of the query system. 
and it is able to retrieve textual passages by means of semantic queries. The sixth tool is a query engine designed and developed, uh, developed to explore the diachronic computational lexicon of the Clavius corpus. It provides a controlled language in order to add the construction of complex query. For example, if we query for the term primo mobile, you can have a general diachronic view of the concepts and the relationships regarding the searcher term. Finally, the seventh prototype is an infographic view showing linguistic annotations upon the textual content. You can note morphological information and the lemmatization besides two semantic annotations. This view uses graphic and mnemonic symbols and colors with highlighting area for showing the annotated phenomena. Although a number of digital tools for textual studies have been developed in the last decades, it is evident and witnessed that a suitable digital environment for textual scholars is still missing. In fact, many researchers have underlined the unavailability of out-of-the-box scholar tools. From a technical perspective, Designing and de uh, developing applications for textual scholarship is challenging because domain specifications are incomplete and sometimes are discordant. In fact, there is not a shared, formal and basic theory from which software engineers could derive their software models. The sketch in this slide, taken from one of my preferred design manuals, shows two important phenomena that I want to highlight. On the right hand, there is a stack of abstraction levels. These abstractions be begin with the low level, and it represents the coding and encoding work done by domain experts, which encoded textual data by using a suitable formal formalism. Advancing to the high levels of the stack, the other keywords represent the characteristics of each specific abstraction until the service, the service level. On the left hand, the diagram shows what generally happens considering the communication aspect among the actors within a project, and in particular, within a digital humanities project. That is, the communication and consequently, the understanding of the domain space is strongly compromised. In this way, people who require service, in this case scholars, and people that should design and develop the system for providing that service, in this case software engineers and developers, do not have a shared vocabulary and a shared perception of the domain of interest. In order to overcome these communication issues, the current methodology and approach in developing tools in the field of digital humanities has to be improved. I mean that the focus on high-level functionalities provided by the end user by means of advanced graphical user interfaces and the textual data and metadata, me metadata encoding to make textual data machine, machine actionable is not enough to meet the goals of implementing a general framework for textual studies. Thus, as the slide shows, a possible method to solve the aforementioned issues could be designing digital applications for the textual scholarly field, start, starting from formal models. This method encompasses the definition of the basic domain entities, the formal abstractions and the relationships among these abstractions. Such a little more complex approach would produce conceptual software models which constitute a level of data and procedural abstractions useful both to people devoted to consume the textual resources and to people devoted to edit these resources. This approach is derived from a general software engineer approach called domain-driven design. Our idea, therefore, is to avoid to produce software for digital humanities in general and for textual scholars in particular too quickly 
that just look like a great success. Indeed, the little focus on the design of the domain model leads to troubles in reusing, evolving, and maintaining digital scholarly applications. Consequently, our research challenge is to adopt the domain-driven design practices, principles, and patterns within the digital textual scholarship field. In fact, domain-driven design encourages to shape the logical design and the structure of a software application by using formal or semi-formal modeling languages, such as UML and design and architectural patterns, so that the whole community, also non-technical people, can understand and actively participate in how software is constructed. One of the main consequences of the introduced approach is the definition of the application user interfaces responding to the domain use cases. I want to highlight how the correct design of APIs is crucial for developing domain-driven and shared tools. Because these interfaces are the only points of dependency among the agents that use and the agents that implement the model. Concretely, the model of the domain of the application user interface can be implemented by means of defining domain-specific abstract data types. An ADT is a high-level, user-defined and customizable data type, which internal representation is not directly accessible. Data and functions which operate on them are bound into a single entity of concerns. Thus, the definition of ADTs for textual studies will lead to the definition of standard and shared application program interfaces and defining behavior without knowing the representation of the data processed. This would ensure a strong decoupling, decoupling between people that use tools and people that actually implement them. Therefore, we have to define types for our domain like the stack entity for the general purpose problems. There is a well-known, large-used and useful abstract data type completely defined in terms of its behavior. The architectural model that we are developing is composed of a number of cooperating and reusable ADTs offering the basic functionality and services to the domain of textual studies. To technical, I want to bring your attention to the top left corner of the slide, where a snippet of code shows a possible use of abstract data types by means of an object-oriented language, in this case, Java programming language. Specifically, the document entity is an ADT initialized by parsing the text, marked up following some formalism, for example, the TDI guidelines. Thereafter, the document object that is, that is an, an instance of the ADT does not work on the data or on a particular representation, but it operates just on abstraction by means of appropriate API. So the lacks introduced in the previous slides concerning abstractions become evident when software designers and software developers look for formal and shared models in order to develop reusable components. Therefore, for, from a software engineer perspective, digital textual studies need a rigorous and thus formal definition of what I call a type system for textual scholarship. This is an example of the work that we have done for designing the alignment API. Once the software engineer approach and the development process have been defined, the, success, the successive step is to arrange the software architecture for the digital scholarly environment. Consequently, we have chosen to use the microkernel architectural pattern. This architecture is adopted in various modern operating systems because it provides the minimal functional entities of a general environment, managing the evolution of the application 
in terms of functional and non-functional requirements. In fact, the extended functionality can be plugged into the microkernel through specific interfaces and adapters. So the objective of our initiative is to provide textual scholars with flexible and reusable tools by using the most useful object-oriented techniques, beginning from the formal definition of a set of core entities described by means of the unified modeling language. We plan to properly design the application program interfaces for each component, adopting a user-centered strategy and domain-specific modeling in order to share and standardize the behavior of the system without depending on any specific implementation. The microkernel architecture provides an effective way to put all these requirements together. In the first release of the textual environment, we defined each textual element taking into account some basic principles. And on those principles, we have designed and implemented a set of core entities as the fundamental data types share among all the components of the environment. If there is time, I can illustrate the UML diagram in this slide. I don't know Matt, if I have Okay. Okay. So the source class is in charge of managing the serialized data. It is composed of a payload representing the information conveyed by the textual resource and the source type which indicates the nature of the source. And the place of interest classes identify through a composition pattern specific data fragments of the source content and they are used to establish the boundaries of an annotation. The locus provides a standoff text annotation technique able to tackle, for example, the overlapping hierarchies problem, which cannot be handled easily with inline markup techniques. An annotation represents an information associated to a locus, and it is characterized by an annotation type. Since the hierarchical structure of the source may evolve over time, the changes to the relative tree must be managed. Consequently, we, did, we decide to explore the, fl the flexibility of object-oriented model by adopting the role design pattern between different annotation types dynamically. This pattern has been implemented by three classes, annotation role, annotation role element, and annotation role structure. Moreover, an annotation is a source in itself, and thus it can be annotated recursively. The abstractions of Omega environment are able to map requirements in the problem domain, it has the test was scholarship domain, into the implementation model of the solution domain. The use case depicted in this slide shows an object-oriented approach to meet this objective. Indeed, by using the Java programming language, it is possible to design and implement fluent domain-specific APIs. Specifically, the example implements the use case concerning the creation of a textual resource giving an annotation to a fragment of this text. So in this contribution, I have described some critical issues in the design and implementation of a flexible digital scholarly platform called Omega for the study of documents, texts, and languages. The ongoing microkernel implementation that is pub published on GitHub en encompasses the implementation of a set of core entities defined as domain-specific ADT exposing domain-specific APIs. Besides on the work done, we have planned to carry on the initiative by enhancing the first set of APIs and to implement advanced set of use cases for textual scholarship, sharing Omega with the community, fostering its application to more use cases, and last but not least, involving other developers in its advancement. Of course, 
We are also planning how to converge towards initi initiatives like Clarin and ARIA. This is this list a selection of reference, and uh, I finish. Thank you. Questions? I mean, clearly, Angelo, this is very much along the lines of what we're looking at. And it's clear to see, uh, well, it doesn't surprise me, having known you and your colleagues uh, at PISA uh, over many years, uh, to see this, this level of thought. So I think this is really a, a topic for systematic analysis and comparing it with the use cases, for example, of Coloca. And DBAW would be really interesting as well as the other ones we've looked at. Uh, I'm quite excited to see this, I have to say. Questions? <laughs>